So what I would like to do is uh, maybe begin this craft talk by just telling like, a little bit of a story about uh, something that happened to me uh, it's a few years ago now, but when I was working on my first novel, a novel called The Ecstatic. Um, and uh, uh, that in that novel, it's a story of a young man named Anthony James who's uh, 23, he's been kicked out of school, out of college. Uh, he's morbidly obese, he's conceivably schizophrenic. Uh, though he's not diagnosed, uh, and his family basically like takes him, finds him and takes him home uh, to sort of heal him. And then what we discover in the course of the novel is that in fact his family's worse off than he is, uh, and then they all just destroy each other. Right? Uh, so it's a lighthearted <laughs> story. Um, but while, uh, so based on just that description, you can imagine that a lot of the story was uh, about the. A lot of the story took place, it was about the character of Anthony sort of growing, changing, falling apart, much more than it was about anything plotted or anything like that. Um, nonetheless, I, uh, um, I, I, when I was thinking about this craft talk, I thought um, one story was illustrative of the ideas I want to discuss here today. Um, I had one chapter in particular where Anthony is given a little money by his family, and he goes to the supermarket to buy cereal. Right? He goes to the supermarket to buy food. But he ends up in the cereal aisle. And then we spend about 15 pages with him, like looking at each different kind of cereal, Captain Crunch and what Captain Crunch meant to him, and jokes about Captain Crunch, and Diggum Smacks, and whatever the hell else, you know what I mean? All these various things that you can find in the associated supermarket in Rosedale, Queens. Right? So no Kashi. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, what was very interesting, though, was like the, uh, the first reader I had on this, a really, really close friend of mine who I trusted deeply. Whenever she read this chapter, she would just sort of, three, four pages in, just not out. Right? Uh, and, uh, and I would become more and more sort of incensed. Like, why are you daring to sleep during my, you know, genius sort of thing about cereal boxes? You know, and her, and her point was, it's boring. Uh, and then her second point was, well, and I said, well, why do you think it's boring? And she said, well, nothing happens. And I said, what are you talking about? We're inside his head. He's talking about cereal. He's talking about his associations with cereal. And the more I tried to, to sort of argue for why something was happening, the more I came to realize nothing was happening. And it was boring. It was essentially, if I was going to describe, really, 10 to 15 pages, a man stands in the aisle of cereal. That's, in theory, that could be great, but it was not great. You know? and the main reason it was not great was because I was not aware that that's what was happening in the chapter, I mean in the section. Um, the, the point of my talk, or the, the point I'm going to move toward, uh, sometimes when I give this talk, um, and anyone who has been in the class a while before is going to basically be hearing the same pieces again, I apologize. Um, uh, people sometimes think that what I'm trying to argue for is lots of action. Uh, uh, but when I say things, you need to understand what's actually happening in your work, and you need to make things happen in your work. But I'm not trying to argue for tons of action, necessarily. I am trying to argue for you being aware of what actions are actually happening in your work, so that when you revise them and think about how you can work with them, you actually understand what you're doing. You know. Uh, so uh, as a sort of an example of, of uh, writing things but not being quite aware, I would suggest thinking about um, almost any early draft of something that you've written before. At least this is my experience, and it's certainly my experience when I teach. Um, that no matter what is, actually, what is supposed to be happening on the page, in the early drafts, the entire story, the entire chapter, the entire scene, feels like somebody sitting at their desk writing a scene where somebody fights a shark. As opposed to, the scene is supposed to be about somebody trapped in the middle of the ocean fighting a shark, and it doesn't feel that way. And, um, and the, the author, when you give it to them, you say, like, I don't know why, but this is inc incredibly unengaging, let's say. It dull seems too harsh. It's incredibly <laughs> unengaging. Uh, and, and the author says, but they're fighting a shark, and that's not actually true. What you've actually written is somebody imagining somebody fighting a shark while sitting at a desk. And that's what the work often feels like. Um, 
So, uh, so this idea of awareness is the thing that really, really, I think is important to me. And I'm assuming on some level, the vast majority of you are also writers. Uh, and so I tend to think when I was thinking about this craft class, I thought rather than talk about the ways that I necessarily write, I thought we might go over two pieces, two stories that are very different, but they can offer some very basic nuts and bolts um, methods of being aware about what's happening in your work so that those things will actually serve you no matter what kind of thing you want to write. You want to write genre, you want to, uh, like you want to write crime, you want to write romance, you want to write realism. I don't think it actually matters for the examples that I'm giving. This, the point of reading these two pieces is just to help you understand what you're getting down. Yeah? Um, I feel like I can't say that enough just because sometimes we'll get a little bit out of shape about something. So. All right, so if you take out the deadly circle, um, the other thing I usually do is have, uh, if I'm in like a classroom, we will read this together like around the table because it helps, it's nice to actually hear other people's voices. Uh, but since I'm the only one with the mic, uh, I'm gonna read this and uh, you'll just read along with me. And what I'd like you to do as we're going through this is try to make notes for yourself and say, and just try to note what's happening. What actually happens in the present, in the story. And it's not a terribly long story. It's called The Deadly Circle by Samuel Fuller. Mike Halpin made an incongruous picture as he scurried down the grass-grown road which crossed the Canadian boundary from New York. The road he was, he, had, he was on had been made by loggers and trappers nearly a century ago. It had then lapsed into a deer trail until American Prohibition opened it again as an excellent route for smugglers. It meandered through a rugged, almost primeval forest from the Adirondacks far into Canada. Mike Halpenny, a New York gunman, was hurrying along this road a half hour before sunset, dressed as he probably would have dressed for a stroll along Fifth Avenue, except that now he carried in his right hand a Winchester rifle of the latest model. This rifle was loaded and unlocked. Mike had parked his car a quarter of a mile back. Mike wanted to kill Jake Conti with a single shot. He knew old Jake fairly well. He walked another quarter of a mile before coming to the selected spot. It was a place where the road dipped abruptly into a narrow valley at the bottom of which was a gorge, a mere crack in the earth. The second growth, birch and spruce, which crowded the old road elsewhere, here swayed back on both sides, leaving a small open space which was covered with stunted shrubs and glacial rocks. A cinch, he agreed. This is sure old Jake's spot. Old Jake Conti, whom Mike was stalking, had a strange racket. He was a bootlegger who smuggled American alcohol into Canada, selling it there at a modest 200% profit. He wasn't a gunman, not even a gangster. In fact, he was a rather respectable married man. His wife, Dolly, was much younger than he, and it was because of Dolly and a matter of several thousand dollars that old Jake was now driving toward his death. Mike Halpenny had been a driver for Jake until a month before, when Jake had learned that the younger man had been stepping out with Dolly. Jake had led Mike into his warehouse, and there had given him a most deliberate and exhaustive beating. Mike Halpenny looked strange kneeling there behind the tree roots. His suit was light blue, his socks and tie still, a light, a still lighter blue, and his shirt was white with fine blue stripes. He wore low shoes of black and white leather. He crouched in silence, but his appearance seemed to make a clamor amid the dignified stillness of the forest. In a few minutes, this stillness was rudely shattered by the noise of a motor. The big truck came into sight on the opposite crest. It lumbered down the short slope, then almost stopped as Jake changed gears at the log bridge. Jake was bending over the wheel, staring down at the rough bridge. He had a half black cigar in his half of a black cigar in his mouth and was talking to himself in a grumbling sort of way, common to lonely men. He had almost crossed the bridge and had changed gears when suddenly a small black hole appeared, as if by magic, right in the middle of his forehead. The truck acted as if it had been struck a vital blow. It lurched and went careening off the road. As it whirled to its side, Jake's body went hurtling through the air, landed on the edge of the gorge, and fell to the bottom. Mike was cursing. Twenty feet below him, he could see the dead body of Jake sprawled comfortably against the far side of the narrow gully. Jake had fallen so that he was leaning against the wall. His left arm had caught on a snag of rock, and this held his hand in an odd, beckoning gesture, which was lost upon the unimaginative Mike. 
Mike had to run up the little valley nearly a hundred yards before he could get down to where Jake was. But once there, the rest was easy. The roll of bills was in a chamois bag under Jake's left arm. He rifled through these rapidly, grinned with satisfaction, then turned and ran up the gully. Now came the bright part of Mike's plan. It really was Dolly's idea. Put the gun where it will never be found, she had said. So when Mike crawled out of the gully, he went straight into the woods. He roamed around more or less aimlessly, looking for a spot that would be easy to dig into. A little more than 100 yards from the edge of the woods, he found a tiny open space carpeted with soft, rotted leaves. Using his hands and the rifle, he dug down a foot or more and carefully buried the weapon. Then, flashing his light among the spectral trunks of the birches, he started to trot away. He wove back and forth among the trees, following the spot of light. In a little while, he began to run. In less than five minutes, he knew that he should have come to the road long ago. Well, the remedy was easy. He turned and ran the other way. It seemed to him that he ran that way for an hour. No road. He was becoming panicked. Mike Halpenny was a very smart young man, but he did not know that a human being cannot walk in a straight line unless he has something to guide him, or unless he is walking on a marked path, such as a city pavement. A man who doesn't know enough to walk towards two selected objects, keeping them in line, will walk into, in a circle or change his direction at every feature of the ground. So Mike Halpenny wandered. Once in the middle of the night, he had sense enough to sit down and try to reason him to try to reason himself out of his position. But the more he thought, the more frightened he became. He got up and started circling a tree and counting. At ten, he halted and started to run madly in the other direction, in the direction he was facing. He ran until he was exhausted. At this time, though he didn't know it, he was not twenty feet from the road and less than fifty from his car. But when he started again, he went off at an angle to the right. After that, he roamed at diverging angles and in steadily decreasing circles until dawn. Just as su at sunrise, he came out of the woods into a little open space. He didn't recognize the place, but just out to be out of the woods was such a relief that he gave a hoarse cry and ran down the rough slope. Suddenly, the ground seemed to open under him. He, drove out, he dove out headfirst into a rocky gorge. <laughs> Hours later, Mike Halpenny awoke with the hot sun beating down on his bare head. He was lying among small, blood-covered rocks. He tried to say, where am I, but his lips wouldn't move. He tried to move his legs, but though he could see them, it was as if they weren't there at all. He couldn't even move a foot. He found that he could move his head slowly. To the left stretched the bottom of a dry boat, covered with rocks. He saw a white butterfly floating about idly. He moved his head slowly to the right. Within a few feet of him sat Jake Conti, his left arm still hanging to the snag and having that queer beckoning gesture. Mike Halpenny had traveled the inevitable circle of the lost. I always like to think uh, you should just hear the <laughs> that, that uh, episode of Alfred Hitchcock presents kind of tale to it. So um, I'm going to move to the board now, which is uh, what I'm going to ask if I'm quiet just let me know um, so what I would suggest doing if I had a story like this this is my first draft um, only in an effort to understand what story I had actually written I would now go through the entire piece and I would just I tend I like to use squares but of course you can use any shape you like uh, and just call them like plot squares or present squares and they're just there to ruthlessly and simply state what happens in the present not, and, uh, and, and to, to be clear, the other thing that sometimes uh, comes up is, uh, well, like if I have a character make coffee, then I could say plot-wise, they stand up, they go to the counter, they pick up the coffee cup. You know, I could go through the minutiae of every step. But, and you could do that, but that would be another way of fooling yourself into thinking much more interesting action is happening and much greater amounts of action are happening than, rather than just writing, the character got up and made coffee. And then having to accept, like, that's all I did. That's all I came up with, right? So the first action here, if you take a look at the story again, I read my first purple square. So the first action basically is the entire first section. On, on page 273, those, uh, all those para paragraphs about Mike Calpenny making a Congress picture, all the way to a cinch 
he grinned. This is sure old Jake's spot. All of that is just Mike finds, finds his spot in the race. So just to be clear, so the line, Mike had parked his car a quarter of a mile back. I mean, I, I apologize if this sounds like a little uh, insulting, if my tongue's a little insulting, but I feel like I always miss these steps, and that's the reason why I, I want to just be really clear. Mike parked his, had parked his car a quarter of a mile back. It did not happen in the present action of the story, obviously, right? Mike. Mike wanted to kill Jake Conti with one single shot is not an action. Like a lot of times, motivation, when we're writing, the motivation feels like an action. Like it's the most important thing. Why do people want to do things? But for this particular kind of um, chart, example, whatever, you just be ruthless and you remind yourself, but that's not an action. Unless he does something, like if we see him go by the gun to shoot Jay County, then we say, okay, that was an action. But if we just find out he wanted to do it, you know what I mean? Like, I want to take a shower. I haven't taken that shower yet. I took a shower earlier. <laughs> <laughs> so, I realized that sounded much nastier. It seemed like it came out of my mouth. All right. So then the next box, if we turn to the next page, uh, if we turn to page 274, the first two, the first two paragraphs there are all just backstory. And one of the biggest mistakes that people make is to think that backstory is action. Backstory. So, like, you know, you read something and it says, like, uh, this is often what will happen. The character, uh, uh, Sarah came into the room. She had the gun poised in her left hand. Her abusive stepfather, who, had, who was now so old that she was no longer scared of him, sat in his wheelchair. She came up behind him with the pistol, put it to the back of his neck, and break. Forty years ago, they first <laughs> met and said, well, and that can be a fine, that can be fine as a way to, to, uh, to tell a story, but none of that is now action. As far as the reader is concerned, you have literally basically hit pause on the player with a character like this. And it, there's nothing wrong with it, but you have to remind yourself, all that I've done so far is have that. And uh, oftentimes people do that, I find, because um, one reason I should speak I won't project. The reason I do it, and I find other people might do it, is because they think, they know that halfway through their story there's actually something exciting and interesting. But they're not willing to cut out the first half that even they know is boring. Because they think you have to know what kind of cereal Anthony really needs. You know? <laughs> it's so important because later when he has a crunch fairy cut in his mouth, you'll understand his existential pain. <laughs> but just jump past that to the existential pain in an active present, please. 